I did a <coughs> related to lab three. I did a drawing performance test to see how fast uh, I could uh, draw a minimal diameter <coughs> balls or points. <coughs> And instead of using draw circle, I, you can look in, in uh, TFT uh, master.c, there is a function called draw pixel, which is lower level. You specify x, y, and a color. It draws pixel. So I just drew five pixels in a cross shape, which approximates a, a ball of radius 2. That's as good as you can do at this resolution. And with then use the uh, PT git time macro which allows you to read out the millisecond timer. So PT git time allows you to read out the the, the millisecond uh, thread timer. So I timed the, uh, the thread to see how long it took. And 400, 400 of these 2x2 two two balls took 51 milliseconds. So that's about 20 frames a second. That's, that's fast enough. 500, therefore, takes around 60 milliseconds. Actually took 64 milliseconds. But by the time you get to that, so that's now just about 15 frames a second, which is the minimum rate we're going to accept. So I don't think you're going to be limited by drawing speed for the number of balls you can animate. My guess is that the calculation speed is going to dominate that. Yes? Wait, wait, what? PT get time uses the one millisecond thread timer that runs in an interrupt service routine off of timer five. So this is just, the, the so it uses system time which is just ticking away at a millisecond rate. So we're starting lab three this week. And there's a whole bunch of technologies here that, we, that you're going to need for this. There's uh, reading the ADC, which I want to talk more about today. There is, uh, of course, doing fixed point animation. And there is a, required, there's a requirement to use direct memory access to produce sound effects through the VREF DAC, the onboard DAC. There's an onboard DAC, it's a 4-bit DAC. So you're going to have to ask yourself, what kind of sound effects can you put out through a 4-bit interface? Well, you, you can do sine wave bursts. You can actually do voice. I would guess you're going to want the sound effects to be fairly short. There are three required sound effects, plus one point, minus one point, and game end. You can make them anything you want. They have to be distinct. In other words, you have to be able to tell A from B from C. But that's the only requirement. So it could be three different pitches of square wave, if you want to get really cheesy. You could, uh, you could put out, you could use SRAN to put out a random noise burst. Uh, you could put out a series of impulses, put out a sine wave, whatever you feel like. Short words. So, there's a bunch of different stuff here that's going to be necessary to make this work. Are there any general questions about Lab 3 at this point? 
about the homework. Which is due tomorrow for some people. Yes? To do what? What do you mean reset the game? So, at reset, you mean where it says at reset? Okay, reset happens exactly once, right? Generally speaking, you're not allowed to press reset at any time during a demo. <coughs> Right, except once at the beginning of the demo, at reset, the program should draw a playing field consist consisting of a rectangle, 320, blah, 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 set the running time clock, start firing balls of radius 2. Okay, what do you, what, what's the question? So, I see what you're saying, yes. Uh, the the this should really should say restart. So you you might need a start button. Uh, in this case, because there's enough logic here, there's so much logic to do. I will accept a reset button as a start button. Because you got a lot of requirements here on this. And yes, we could add a button, but you already know how to do that because you probably did it in the last lab. <clears throat> yes? This is the reset button on board. Oh, okay. On the hardware reset button. I will, for this lab, I will accept the hardware reset button as a game start button. What are the questions, questions about these requirements? You will notice that you'll be graded on the number of simultaneous balls you can animate at greater than or, fifth, greater than or equal to 15 time, uh, frames per second. This suggests that you might want to build a frame timer so you can get as close to 15 as you possibly can. Balls can be as small as you want them to be. Could be single pixels. Turns out on this display, it's hard for me to see single pixels, but that's acceptable. Score and time should be displayed. Well, as long as you're displaying a score and a time, you may as well also display a frame time, which will tell you how your optimization is going. Don't have to, but that could be useful for debugging. Since, PT time, since the uh, P, uh, macro PT get time returns the number of milliseconds since the last time, since system start, it's fairly easy to figure out uh, uh, thread time. Game ends after a fixed time, which you choose. No questions? Wow. This is a complicated lab. Yes. What 
I think we talked about this last time, but the <clears throat> question is, what happens if, if you have several events happen nearly at the same time or at the, at, within one frame of each other, and you have a plus one event, a minus one event, and the game ends? What do you play? And I'm going to suggest, I mean, you could, that's a matter of policy. I didn't specify. I think the first one that comes through. Any questions on the vector dynamics? Yes. This is more the math used, the big 16 math used in vector dynamics. Uh-huh. If you square a number with a multiply big 16 command, is it guaranteed to have the positive number? Because in some cases, I've actually got negative numbers from squaring the big 16. If you get a negative number, it means you overflowed. So if the if the radius, if the dis, if the difference in radii between two, if the rate if the vector is more than two hundred and fifty six units long, then you are going to come up with a 16 bit, actually greater than 127 long. Then you are going to, when you square it, overflow the limit of, of 2 to the 15th on the magnitude of a fixed point number. And since the screen sizes is great, they can be as far apart as the square root of the sums of the squares of 320 and 240, 500 some, uh, it sounds to me like you're going to have to check first and make sure that the absolute size of delta x and delta y is less than some value, which you choose, let's say, 3. Because it cannot possibly interact if either one of them is greater than three. And as long as that is true, then the only time, in fact, you never actually have to calculate this because you're either going to be interacting, in which case you know that the radius is two. Diameter is 4, or you're not interacting at all. So only calculate, so you never calculate this where the, in, in the region of, of magnitude r where you might get overflow. because it will then produce negative numbers. Can't parse that. I couldn't get the question. Uh, I mean, on the first, the question is uh, in our homework, 
uh, need we to uh, decide the hit counter? The hit counter. Yeah. The homework? Uh, yeah, because in the term uh, will give us a very hit counter to avoid. <coughs> So there is a hit counter, but in the homework it only asks you to write out the vector arithmetic, right? So I'm not asking you to specify the number of hits, if that's what you mean. I would say that um, the number of frames you're going to have to, if the the number of frames that you're going to have to set the hit counter to is going to be something like five frames. It's going to be a few. But I'm not asking that in the homework, I don't think. <clears throat> what I was asking in the homework was really for you to think about the assignment and to s s scalarize, make scalar the vector equations in, in lab three because C only does the scalar arithmetic. Yes? Balls tunneling, yes, of course, because since because you're not calculating exact collision times, although if you were doing this in a research context, you would. So if you were doing hard hard ball, hard ball molecular dynamics, you would calculate the exact impact time and then calculate forces based on that. I'm only asking you to calculate at finite time steps. <laughs> So there's a chance the balls are going to interpenetrate before you get to the point of calculating the, the forces on them. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to pretend they didn't interpenetrate, that they are merely two, they're two uh, radii apart. They still bounce off, yes, absolutely, they bounce off of each other. If they interpenetrate, what should happen? I mean, so, I mean, you could say, yes, all right, they bind. Who remembers a Leonard, what a leonard Jones potential is? Oh, it's a while ago, isn't it? Remember inverse, inverse 6, inverse, inverse 12, hard ball dynamics? PCAM, chemistry. Anyways, you could redo this with a Leonard Jones potential where you calculate explicitly the forces when they interpenetrate. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm going to say if they've interpenetrated, you pretend they didn't and calculate the force. Yes? Uh, so what if they, like, so bad if they pass through each other? So that says that they're going, so, they, so they're approaching and on, let's see, how does this work? So on one frame they're here, they're going like this, and on the next frame they're here and here. And so... You ignore it. I mean, that's a, that's a limitation of, this, of the algorithm I'm giving you. If the balls are going extremely fast, they're going to be able to pass through each other. Now, how fast do they have to go? They have to go for the, so the, the total velocity, let's say if one is still and the other is moving, it's going to have to go at a rate of over 
four pixels per frame at 30 at 20 frames a second that's 80 pixels it's rocketing across the screen pretty good now yes you might get acceleration to that point where if you get a if you get just the right combination of collisions you could get a point going that fast the thing that saves you is did you know, do you know this now this is a this is a psychophysical fact that your resolution is velocity dependent the resolution of your eyes is velocity dependent for 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 a, a, an image that's not moving when i look at the autodesk icons on the back of your laptop uh, your eyes are probably good for a little better than one milliradian resolution. So you can see about a thousand points in one radian. And <clears throat> if you have a object moving at one radian per second across your field of view, your resolution drops by a factor of 10 or so. And if it's moving at 10 radians per second, you can't tell anything about it. Back in the day when Star Wars was released on Laserdisc, Laserdisc, 12 inch Laserdisc, you could stop frame through high resolution images and one of the frames, a few of the frames where the some of the some of the fighters zoom off into infinity one of the fighters is actually a tennis shoe <laughs> and you can't see it nobody ever sees it because your resolution doesn't allow you to pick up that kind of error so this is all getting to the point where if you have something moving across the screen fast you're not even going to notice that it's wrong There's all kinds of interesting psychophysics. It turns out your resolution in grayscale is, uh, is what I said, it's about a milliradian, but your resolution in red green is vastly worse. So, why don't you see red and green fringes around everything? If your re resolution in the green red is so bad, why doesn't every red object have a fringe around it? because everything you see you compute and you're assigning colors to the object you know must be there <clears throat> my object recognizer sometimes messes up and assigns the wrong color to things if you watch your vision system I'll execute in real time you'll, you'll notice all kinds of errors that you make usually you throw those away because they're distracting and and you don't want to appear too strange but, uh, but in fact, you're, 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 you make lots of errors that way. Any other questions on this? So, on the I've been playing with the proto threads page. So if we go there. There's now three examples on the TFT section. And the, the first one is how to bounce a ball with gravity and drag using a 1616 fixed point. Probably want to look at that. You want to look at that again today? No, we've seen that. Tell me if you do. Second one is uh, uh, analog read. I decided I better. Uh, Simplify the ADC a little bit by putting the code into a thread and then playing some more with the fixed point. So here's the same old fixed point uh, macros that we talked about last time. And and the same old timer thread that just does system time here. But the, the, the thread that's more interesting is a ADC read. And once again, 
the pointer stick. Do somebody see it? Aha! Uh -huh. I'm glad you have good recognition. And so, decide, and I spent a half an hour trying to figure out why my code didn't work because I forgot the static uh, keyword right there. And so, fix 16 v, v fix was pr producing a random number on each time through the thread. None of us are immune. So I'm defining a static int ADC9. That stand, the 9 here means I'm using AN9, signal AN9, which on this package is pin 26 and is the ninth analog input channel. Defining a float voltage and a fixed voltage. Just to play with how they're how they're scaled. And then we're doing a float to fix of 3.3 over 1023. That's V ref divided by full scale on the ADC. Then we merely go through the loop. We read the ADC and then acquire a new, uh, set up the ADC to acquire a new reading. Again, I set this to manual, you don't have to set it to manual. But uh, then, calculate the absolute voltage from the ADC reading. There's a number between 0 and 1023. V, v ref is uh, 3.3 volts, mas or manos. And, and uh, the scale factor for full scale is 1023. So this converts to voltage. Then did the same thing with the fixed point arithmetic. So we do an int to fix on ADC9 and then do a 16 bit, a mult fix 16 multiply to convert it to a voltage. Then print this. And so ADC9 prints as a int between 0 and 1023. And really, that's what you're going to be using for this lab, because all you care about is converting the potentiometer output, 0 to 1023, into a position, y-axis position from 0 to 240 or so, sounds like a divide by 4, to go from 1023. So you really don't need to do this other, you don't have to convert to a voltage. But I was doing that to see if I could get the fixed point right. The floating voltage is easy, it's a 6.3 F. That says, Give me a total field of total of six long with only three after the decimal point. And you wouldn't want any more than that because there's only 10-bit uh, accuracy. Then to convert the fixed point to a nice decimal format, because the float reads like 2.75. I'd like to have the fixed point read like 2.75. And so I'm using this weird format. It's a percent D point percent zero three D. That's actually two prints. The first one is fixed in a V fix. This gives us the integer part of V fix. Then the the decimal portion is fixed int V fix times a thousand minus fixed int fixed in 16 of v fix times a thousand. That gives us the remainder. Putting the 0, 3 here means you always print exactly three places even if the high order digit is 0, which in this case we want. The advantage of this is that it uses no, no floating point operations. If we do a floating, if we do a floating print, it's very slow. Floating print might slow down your compute loop 
by a factor of 2. You will not have time to do any floating point operation in the animation loop. <clears throat> Not a floating multiply, not a fix to float, not a float to fix, nothing in the animation loop. <coughs> then the rest of this is the, is the mess that actually sets up the analog converter. But I don't think you have to fiddle with this very much, except maybe this, to, to choose a different channel for the uh, for the analog input and if you want to make it automatic you can uh, set auto sampling on but are there any other questions on this yes yeah This is not a float. This is a, a raw integer. So this is read off of here. This is a raw integer read off of here. The, the, this one, this, I'm floating this because it is in fact an integer and I want to produce, I want to, I wanted to do a floating output voltage here just to show you how. I'm asking you to read the code. That's what I'm asking you to do. Experience shows that's the only way to get people to read the code. Do you fill around the rest of calls and things like that in the graph library? Are those blocking or is it just like spin up the SPI and the SPI are able to hear it? <clears throat> the you're talking about the draw pixel calls and the so, so presumably it calculates where it's put the pixels at a fixed time. These are all pretty much blocking. Okay. The SPI transactions are actually rather fast, less than a microsecond per per pixel. So given that, in order to avoid those errors, would it be reasonable to simulate at a higher frequency than you animate? Ooh. It might be, yes. So, it, does it make sense to simulate at a higher frequency than you animate? So that would mean that you'd want to do perhaps two compute cycles per draw cycle. Wow. That'll give you better accuracy it'll cost you animation speed. For this assignment, since I'm not asking for accuracy so much as speed, I think you better stick with one compute cycle per, per frame. Now, could you detect, is there a way to detect a potentially uh, prob problematic collision and deal with it. And the answer is yes, probably. I'm not sure it's worth the time again to do that, but you could look at particles that are close together and approaching rapidly and interpolate a frame for that particle. Ugh, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, it kind of leaves a bad film on the teeth to think about that, doesn't it? So, you could do that. I'm not asking you to do that. If this, again, if, it were, if you're doing molecular dynamics to publish a paper on hardball molecular dynamics, yes, you would go for accuracy. Here, I'm only trying to make a playable game.
not realistic, but we, we also maybe want to saturate the ball's velocity so we don't just make it ridiculous on the screen. Well, that's a possibility. Let's say that you had nonlinear damping, as uh, like vol like viscous damping, where where balls tend to accelerate and then not go any faster. Uh, you you might do that. I don't think it's going to be a problem. But uh, if you do that, you want to do that in such a way that it conserves momentum. That means if you have balls coming in like this, you want them to go back out in opposite directions but with the same speed. Uh huh. So I guess that's for a certain sample rate. Yeah. Uh, but this time, the this the ABC always ABC is for something to a mass square, and the uh, altitude sample is still off right there uh, because you use the other part of the field. Yes, that's correct. So So your sample rate requirement is low here because you're sampling a human changing a, a potentiometer. So it doesn't make any sense to sample much faster than perhaps 20 or 30 a second. You just can't move your fingers faster than that. <clears throat> if you wanted very accurate timing at a moderately high rate, then you'd go to an interrupt service routine. If you need faster than a thousand samples a second, you have to go to an interrupt service routine because the minimum thread time is one millisecond. Minimum thread delay time is one millisecond. And if you want to get absolute maximum speed out of the ADC, you in fact can't use an interrupt service routine. You have to go to a direct memory access burst to get up to a megahertz. So in this case, since we're going very slowly, there's no particular reason to turn on an interrupt service routine. May as well just use thread timing. What else? Sure. You can use, do the calculation of the animation thread. This might, be a, this might be an example where there is exactly one thread. Although you might want to read out some parameter more slowly than that. Perhaps uh, average frame time or something of the sort. But I would guess that much of this will be in one thread, maybe, maybe have a separate timer thread for the required, millis uh, second, the required second timekeeping for the, for the game, but probably pretty much one thread, yeah. <clears throat> So you're saying trigger the trigger the thread cal uh, you, uh, using their up service routine to to choose 15 frames a second, and then trigger the thread off of the interrupt service routine. You could do that. You could set a semaphore in an interrupt service routine, or just merely a flag, and say you do a yield until flag goes high. Boink, flag goes high, boom, I do the thread. Would it be faster to just have the animation code inside the ISR? 
It is a bad idea to put animation, uh, any long code inside an interrupt service routine because that kills any sort of multitasking. Uh, <clears throat> what I think makes more sense is to time the thread execution and turn the and and adjust the number of particles until the thread execution is as slow as you can tolerate. Now, you might run out of memory before you run out of before you run out of execution time, depending on, on the structure you use for the particles. I don't think so. So I think that the probably the least amount of work and the simplest to to execute will be to build a thread timer, average over a few frames because the frames are going to vary in time, depending on the number of collisions. Average over the, a few frames and then adjust the number of particles until the average frame rate is uh, 15 per second. So what do you want to hear about next? We've covered a whole bunch of different stuff. Direct memory access, I can talk more about that. Using VREF as a DAC, I can talk more about that. Fixed point arithmetic. What's the hard part here? Ought to become clearer by next lecture. Should I open the lab tomorrow morning? Will anybody show up? Okay, all right. We could do that. If you get there before I have it open, just find me in my office and I'll open it up. I believe that 2300 is going to have a lab session this week, so we can't use it. Sunday, Sunday, Tuesday afternoon. So what other questions do you have about Lab 3? Because I'm sure there's some. Think about it. What do you want to hear about next? Seems a little soon to start lab four, that being three weeks away. <coughs> I will talk more about direct memory access. Sure, I can do that. Mm -hmm. What's the max refresh rate of the DFT? Like, can I do 144 hertz? <sighs> Why 144 hertz out of interest? It's all <laughs> Okay, unless you're doing fruit flies, in which case you need about 500 frames a second. Fruit flies, fruit flies have a fantastically high refresh rate in their brain. So you have to, you have to get up to a very, you know, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. <clears throat> I used to, torture my young children with that phrase because I was trying to see how well they could parse English. Um, um, <laughs> they get tired of hearing it. So uh, DMA, fruit flies, uh, 100, yeah, oh, what's limiting is actually the number of pixels you can draw in that time. There, there, the, I don't know what the refresh rate of the TFT is, but you can update about uh, 200,000 pixels per second. 
Okay, Tamid has some, uh, some of your uh, papers. I think that's the last TA to return uh, reports. Everybody else was here Friday or Wednesday. So, um, find Tamid and uh, come back next time with your hard questions about Lab 3 because there's a pile of stuff to read, folks. <laughs>